All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to Comp 3350 Software Engineering. I hope that you're all having a good day today. Today, uh, what I want to spend some time talking about is uh, finishing up the exercise that we were looking at last time. So I want to take a look at some errors, some actual error messages that, that I have personally made observations about myself. Um, and then I want to move on to talking about the two other kinds of testing that we've effectively been ignoring up until this point and that you're expected to do for your last iteration. Um, so yeah, let's, let's just get straight into it. All right. So, uh, when you, uh, when you're building your application errors, they're just going to happen. Errors happen all the time everybody's app it doesn't matter like this course or just outside in the world we've all seen some kind of error before what should we do we've dealt with exceptions so my general advice here my general advice here is catch the most specific kind of ex exception that you're expecting to to catch or that could be thrown by the dependency that you're dealing with if you cannot handle the exception, just let it go up, let it bubble up and let your app crash. So make sure that you're trying to deal with what you can. And if you can't deal with it, don't even bother trying to deal with it. Make your own kinds of custom exception types so that you can communicate between layers of your application what is actually happening. And so that the presentation layer at the top can inform your user about what has gone wrong. Make the errors that you're getting from your persistence layer or from your logic layer meaningful so that there can be something that the users can see based on what the presentation layer is able to decide. But then you actually have to present something to your user. You have to show them something. This is going to, uh, this is going to step a little bit on the toes of HCI. I think that HCI does cover some of this idea of like, how do you actually communicate errors to users? But that's okay. I'm willing to step on the toes of HCI for just a little bit, because uh, I think it's worthwhile talking about in this course, um, especially since HCI is not a required course, and this is a required course. So yeah, I think it's worthwhile talking about. So uh, I've got errors. I've given these back to you today, uh, and I'm going to show them up on the screen, and they're up on the course web page. So there are many ways that you're going to be able to see this. On the first page, I've got a copy of the questions that you see here. The things that I want you to look for in these different error messages are, what exactly is the problem that the error is trying to communicate to you? So given the context of this example, what is the error actually trying to tell you? What has gone wrong with the state of the app that you're working with right now? These are mostly like technical tools that I've got examples of, but you as devs are the users of those technical tools. You don't build Android Studio. You are a user of Android Studio. You didn't build HSQLDB you're using HSQLDB. How do you fix the problem given what's presented to you in the error message? And I guess the second question should come first. Does the error message actually communicate to you how you should fix that problem? And then finally, I want you to try and decide collectively together, is, is this objectively a good error message? So is this a good error message or is it something that needs to be improved? If you think that the answer to this question is no, what would you do to change it? What would you do to make it into a better error message to convey information to your user about how they can actually solve the problem that, that they're seeing? So I want to start with, uh, with example one here. I'm going to zoom right in on this. This is a, an actual error message that I've seen in Android Studio before. I'm going to give you uh, two minutes to talk about those questions, and then we will come back together. I will ask for some feedback, and we will see what's what with this error message. So please go ahead. All right. So uh, the team that I'm going to pick on first is, uh, is Team 15. So team 15, uh, what, uh, what exactly do you think that this error message is trying to communicate to you, the user? OK. OK. 
okay. 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 Yeah, okay. So what is the problem trying to communicate? What's the problem? Team 15 is uh, Darwin. Darwin? Darwin is pointing out uh, that there's an exception in a plugin somewhere. The plugin is called Android Support. Does it tell you how to fix the problem? I, th I think so, yes. I think so, yes. It tells you how to fix the plugin by making this disable plugin nice and bright and blue. We've used web browsers before. We know generally that that means we can click on that thing. If you keep seeing this error message, disable that plugin. That doesn't solve the problem. It really doesn't solve the problem. This part, null, that's the one that's obvious to me. That is a terrible message. They would be better off not showing the message at all. They'd just be better off not having anything there, just like leaving error message off the screen entirely. When I was talking to Darwin, one of the things that he suggested is, uh, you know, there are clear instructions about what to do here. Yeah, there's this null error message, but if you want to submit a bug report to Google, it's giving you clear indications of what you should do to accomplish that. Of course, that's not going to solve the problem immediately. Like you're going to click the send report, send to Google button, and then somebody might read it eventually, but we have no idea. This isn't solving our problem. This is just letting the vendor know, hey, there's something wrong with this. The other thing that, uh, that was pointed out was this details tab. This might give you the ability to see something like a stack trace. And we can assume that this is Android Studio. The people who are using this are devs. They should know what a stack trace is. But at the same time, for us to see a stack trace in code we didn't write and can't fix, not really going to be something that's super helpful to us. So to me, is this objectively good? And Darwin is saying, I think it's like, OK. It's objectively an OK error message. And I, I think I agree with Darwin. It's OK because there is a clear way to fix the problem, and that is to click this Disable button thing. And it's pretty obvious to me as somebody that's seen error messages before or that we've seen links. That's something that I can do to stop this message from coming back again in the future. Anyone want to add anything to that? Good. OK, good. Let's move on to example two here. So this is a, an error that, uh, that you might see if you were to paste this into your web developer console in Chrome or Firefox. So I'm going to give you the same questions here. The questions are, what exactly is the error trying to communicate? How would you fix the error? You are a user here. You're a dev, yes, but you're a user of the JavaScript engine, or you're, you're a user of the JavaScript language. Does the error communicate this to you, and is it objectively a good error message? You got two more minutes. Please go ahead. All right. Okay. So let's get back together. Uh, the team that I'm picking on is team two this time. And uh, what we're looking at here is some J JavaScript parsing code. So team two, uh, what is this error message trying to communicate to you? I think it's trying to tell us there's um, a syntax error occurring. OK, so there's some kind of syntax error that's occurring in this something, something. Yeah, OK. How do you fix this problem? Where, where, which quotes? What are we talking about here? Double quotes. You can put like a flush. OK. So here, you're talking about here? Yeah. Here? So I, this is line one, column 17. So I think it's actually pointing like here. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. OK. Does, does the error message communicate to you what's expected to be fixed here? Uh, as you can see, no talking. Yeah. So s sort of, but not really. There's, it's kind of confusing. Like, 
I'm not going to get my cursor out and start like pressing the arrow button and watching the column number to see which column I'm supposed to be looking at here. So with that in mind, what would you do to fix this? Like, what would you do to fix the error message that's printed out here? Maybe something more visual, like online. Yeah. Like yeah. So one place where I've seen, like, if you get some kind of syntax parse exception in code, one place I've seen something giving helpful error messages, like underlines and arrows and stuff, is Clang. When you're compiling C code, it points really clearly at what part it's getting stuck on and what it's having trouble with. So improving this error message would be to give some kind of a visual indicator, hey, this is where the problem is, instead of expecting your user to like count columns to figure out where the problem is. OK, thank you, Team 2. Anything else we wanted to add to this one? OK, good. Let's move on to the next one. So example 3 is here. It's the same set of questions. Uh, this is the sign-in page. This this at least was the sign-in page for Reddit. I don't know if it still looks like this, but it was at some point looking like this. You got two minutes, same questions. Please go ahead. <laughs> All right. Uh, so I'm going to pick on team three here. And uh, I, I'm going to be team three today. <laughs> So what exactly is the problem the error message is trying to communicate to me? I, 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 think it's, I think it's pretty clear there's an incorrect username or password. I think that's pretty clear. It's even highlighted things in red. It's highlighted things in red. And I'm also going to point out that there's an exclamation point. And I'm also going to point out that the border size of that box has changed. So it's not just changing red. This is starting to address things like um, issues with color blindness and stuff. So we're not just changing it to red and having something else be green to say that one's OK and the other one's not. We're changing other aspects of it so that we can visually see that there's something wrong with this. It's telling me that the username or password is incorrect. It's not telling me which one is incorrect. How do I, as a user, fix the problem? Well, I guess I have to try either like reread my username or re-enter my password. It's not clear to me which one I need to do. But the error message sort of communicates this to me by highlighting at least one of those fields, although it only highlights one of those fields, regardless, I think, of whether I put in an incorrect username or password. Is this objectively a good error message? I'm going to say that, yes, it is an objectively good error message. And I, I overheard some people saying, well, it, sh it would be better if it just told me it's the password that's wrong. Or it would be better if it told me that it's the username, that, uh, I mean, not the username, and then just leave the password. Uh, the thing that you have to balance with this, and this is outside the scope of this course, with a situation like this one where you're doing authentication, the thing that you're trying to balance with this is, if you tell someone it's a valid username but an invalid password, you might be leaking information. You might be saying, this actually is a username. Similarly, with your, when you're going up through like a sign-up flow, if you say this username is taken, you're implying that that username exists in the system. And now somebody has to figure out what the password is. This is balancing like usability and information that you're leaking. Reddit, I think for the most part, you can find out if a username exists by checking profiles and stuff, I, I think. So that it's not like they need to hide that information. You might be able to hide that. I'm not sure if that's a profile preference or something. but. It's kind of a balance there. Thank you, Team 3. Does anybody else want to add anything to that? OK. So here's the last one. I'm not going to put the whole stack trace on the screen. I'm just going to leave this up. Same set of questions. You got two minutes. Please go ahead. <laughs> I intentionally picked this error message because I know you've all seen this kind of error message. All right. So uh, we're going to do this as the last example that we're doing with this. And um, I'm picking on team 13 this time. So uh, team 13, what, uh, what is this error message actually trying to communicate to you?
<laughs> so something on line, there's something wrong on line 24 of something. Yeah. Okay. It doesn't give you any idea of how, what the error is or how to fix it. No. Uh, I'm, I'm going I, I to I relay something to the class. When I started looking at this kind of exception, uh, that's the part that I see in my console. When I start seeing exceptions like that, that's the part that I see. That's not even the actual error message that I'm supposed to be looking at. That's not the error message that I'm supposed to be looking at. And I'm seeing issues like this in, uh, in 2150 right now with C++, because you try to compile something in C++, and the error message is like 15 terminal screens long, but the actual error is printed on the first line of output. Even worse, there's stuff like java.lang.reflect.method.invoke. I'm not doing reflection here. I don't understand why it's telling me about any of this stuff. This isn't my code. So team 13, I think you're, uh, that you're right. There is something wrong in line 24 of something. Yes, that's, that's good. What, uh, do you think that this is objectively a good error message? I don't think so. And, and what would you do to fix it? What would you do to make this better? What would you give somebody that's reading this error message? Or what would you want? Or what would you want less of in this error message? OK. So like, at least it's saying 30 more here instead of going on. But really, I want to see something like, like that. Maybe. And I don't even really care about any of this stuff, I don't think. I don't think. OK, so less of the stack trace. OK, good. What else would you do to make this better? What would you want more of? Yeah, OK. So more specifics on the exact error. In the state that this is in, we can make in some, some assumptions. This says script reader text. HSQLDB knows that it's reading a file. Tell me what the file name is. Tell me what file you're reading right now so that I know what file to look in. Line 24, that's actually sort of helpful. At least I know which line in my script file to look at if I know which file to look at. But what's wrong with line 24? And this kind of takes us back here to example two with the, our JSON parser. At least this is telling us where and approximately what the problem is. But let's go even further and you know point at it. And one thing that Team 13 pointed out to me that I also kind of forgot about is that when you get an error message in Clang, it does underline it, but it also gives you suggestions about what the problem is and what you can do to fix it. I really just need to put Clang errors in here as a good example, which is it feels weird to do that because it's she's like, oh, it's C, it's C. I don't want to do C stuff. OK, thank you, Team 13. Uh, is there anything else anyone wants to add for this last one? OK, good, good, great. So these are, again, some of these are like uh, you know, error messages that you as a dev are going to see as opposed to you as a person sitting in front of a machine. But it's the same spirit of what I'm trying to get at. Tell the person using your application what's wrong and how they can fix it if they can fix it. All right. So when you're fixing these problems or when you're presenting error messages to users, this applies to both us and, 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 uh, and our users, the error messages that we're producing to our users should be useful. What happened? Why did it happen? If you can fix it, tell them how to fix it. Actually explicitly state what they need to be able to fix that. OK, let's move on to testing. Let's move back to testing. Let's talk more about testing. So far in the course and so far in the work that you've been doing for your projects, everything that we've been doing is, is unit testing. Everything that we've been doing is unit testing. But we've kind of completely ignored the other two types other than 
uh, describing them originally in the, the different kinds of testing that you can do in an application. We kind of just stopped there. We went to unit testing. We talked about mocks and stubs and stuff and test doubles, but then we never really went back to talking about the other two kinds of testing. So integration testing and system testing. Start uh, with a little quiz. I'd like you to do this individually, please, instead of in teams. I shouldn't do this when I'm trying to run a quiz. Shouldn't have made this 60 seconds long. And if I click skip, it's going to skip the question. <laughs> All right. So what's the purpose of testing? The purpose of testing, the purpose of testing, the goal for writing tests is to ensure that we as devs, as we are making changes to code that exists, and as we're adding new things to code, and as we're adding new features and writing new tests for those new features, we want to make sure that when changes happen, we're not breaking the behavior that's already there. That's one of the goals for testing. Another goal for testing is, well, I want to try and use the design that I've come up with. I have to write a test to do something, so I have to use the API that I've created for myself. If using this API is awkward, if it's hard for me to write a test for the code that I've written, I need to maybe think about doing a different design. It's forcing me to think about the design that I've chosen for this thing. When I write a test, in addition to thinking about the design of the code, I'm also showing other people how to use my code. I'm writing a unit test, or I'm writing a test of some kind. I'm trying to demonstrate to you, hey, when you are trying to use this code, this is ex what I, as a dev, am expecting you to do to use the code that I've written. It's not, it's not to find bugs. It's to prevent us releasing bugs. Yeah, sure, it's to prevent us from releasing bugs, but our goal isn't going into testing to try and find all the bugs that we've added to our code. We don't intentionally add bugs to code. We don't. We're not going in with the idea of, I got to find all the bugs in this thing. I want to verify the behavior. I want to document the code that I've written. I want to make sure that when other people make changes to this code, it's still going to work the way that I thought it was going to work. There's only two questions. This is my chance to do it. I'm going to do it.
So I, I'm going to say that uh, testing the interactions between layers, it broadly describes the other two things that we've got here. Testing interactions between layers. Testing the user interface is going to be testing the interactions between our presentation layer and all of the other layers that we have below that. Testing the relational database, we haven't done that. When you started doing iteration three, when you're starting to do this, when you're starting to do iteration two, when you're starting to add your implementation of a relational database, you didn't test the database. All of your unit tests are still using the stub implementations. As you're going forward, using mocking libraries to implement your stubs, you're still not testing the relational database. So we're still missing that part. Testing the seams between the layers and interactions between layers, that kind of fits with both of those. Something's missing. This is a terrible quiz because all the answers were basically right all the time. But we get to see who hit the button the fastest. Who is it? Alex. Congratulations, Alex. Oh, wow. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. OK. Here, can you take one and pass it back? Thank you. Unit testing, the goal of unit testing is to basically say, I want to have, uh, so when I say SUT, SUT here, uh, just for defining terminology, there's a system under test, system under test. In unit testing, my system under test is like methods within a class. The methods that we have within classes in the architecture that we've got have dependencies. We've got dependencies between our business layer and our persistence layer, our logic layer and our persistence layer. When we were setting up this unit testing for the system under test that is our logic layer, we were trying our best to isolate it from that logic layer, especially as we add a relational database to this thing. We still need to test interactions between layers though. The goal here is to ask the question and to answer the question, does this unit work by itself, unit testing? Does this unit work with specific dependencies? Does it work with specific dependencies? This, this seam that we're testing here is between the persistence layer and the uh, a logic layer. And the question that we're trying to ask in this course and the question we're trying to answer in this course is, does the system under test work with a real database? Does it work with a real implementation of a real persistence layer, a real relational database? When you're writing integration tests, they are going to look fairly similar to the unit tests that you've written. So you have a suite of unit tests already. Each test that you have isolates the, an implementation in the logic layer or in your, do, your object class, your domain model. The integration tests that you're going to be writing are going to be similar in scope to unit tests. They're also going to use the same tech. You're still going to use JUnit to do this. You're going to be writing tests for behavior. You want to verify that when you do something with this system under test, this unit that you're trying to evaluate, does it still work correctly with the, with the real implementation? The key difference here is that we're not going to use a test double. We're actually going to use the actual relational database implementation for this thing. That said, every test that you write should be independent of the other tests that you're writing. When we're talking about unit testing, we're saying that we want to isolate the unit. I want to evaluate the behavior of this method in this layer of my architecture without worrying about the persistence layer. Now we're saying, I want to evaluate the behavior of this method and the persistence layer and as they work together. But what I'm trying to say here is that the outcome of a test, whether it passes or fails, should not affect the outcome of other tests. 
I'm going to be writing tests that are of the form add this object to my persistence layer. I do not want the outcome of that test to affect future tests. I don't want my tests to have to run in a certain order. I want them to be completely independent of each other. Anything that you make changes to in the persistence layer, so creating, modifying, or deleting something should not be expected to be there in tests that come after that one. The solution to this, making sure that you don't have data dependencies between tests is just resetting the persistence after every single test. I'm going to give you, uh, I don't know, like three minutes, I think, to talk about this. Given what you know about JUnit, so thinking about things like the different kinds of annotations that you can add to your test suite. So remembering what those are, you've got test, OK? So you've got test, you've got before, and you've got after. With HSQLDB, thinking about how you're using it, what is the database? What actually is the database? What gets changed? How do you get it back into the state that it was originally? How would you accomplish test isolation? Making sure that every test starts with some clean set or clean state. And once it's finished, we go back to that clean state. And then I want you to think about a question here. Is any integration test tightly coupled with the persistence technology that we're evaluating? And is that OK? Is it actually OK? High coupling, high coupling is bad. Don't do that. But in this specific case, is that OK? I'm going to give you three minutes. I'm going to get back together. I'm going to ask for some feedback. And then we'll keep moving. Please go ahead. OK, if I call on you now. I think so. OK. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So the, uh, the team I'm picking on this time is, uh, is Team 10. It's Team 10. Uh, so given what you know about JUnit, HSQLDB, how might you accomplish this? How do, might you make sure that every test that you have in this suite is independent of the other tests in the suite? Yeah. Yeah. OK, so yeah, use those before and after annotations. So make sure that when you are finished with the test, you're putting it back in its original state again. I'm going to show you what this looks like. I'm not just going to make you all like, oh, I'm going to think about it and then never tell you. I'm just going to show you what this actually looks like. But I do want you to think about it before we get that far. The more important question here is, is it tightly coupled? So we've got this integration test. Is it now tightly coupled to HSQLDB? And is that OK? What do you think? You think it is tightly coupled, though? Yeah, yeah, I'd agree with you. I think this is tightly coupled. And you think it's OK? Yeah. Right. Our goal with this idea of integration testing is that we're trying to evaluate the behavior between two implementations. To evaluate the behavior between two implementations, the test itself kind of has to know about well, those two implementations. It has to know about how those two things work. So for this test to be tightly coupled with specific implementations, that's OK. You might be able to pull out parts of the test and like switch out from, I don't know, HSQLDB to some other like document store or something. So completely replacing the tech there. You might be able to use some of the same tests to be able to evaluate behavior, but you have to change stuff to get back to that original state. So reset the database back to where it's supposed to be again. That's kind of the part that is really tightly coupled with, with the implementation. OK, good. Thank you. Integration tests themselves, running them, are usually more expensive than running unit tests. So unit tests, at least as far as we've been doing them, are taking like tiny fractions of a second because they're entirely in Java and we have no dependencies. We're testing lines of code here, like just a few lines of code. I have an integration test here. I'm going to quickly enter uh, presentation mode here so that you can actually see this. 
Here is an integration test that's in the sample project. This one is called Access Courses IT. We have an instance of our logic layer, and then we have a file. In the before annotation, so this is my setup method, the thing that I'm doing is I've got this method CopyDB. Let me click on that. CopyDB is taking a copy of the script file. So we have that script file in our assets directory. It's taking a copy of that script file and it's putting it into somewhere else. It's making a copy of it. It's making a temporary file and it's copying it to that location so that we have a fresh copy of the database. So test starts. The very first thing that happens is that we make a copy of the database. Oh no, how do I navigate back there? Okay. Once we make a copy of that database, then we're creating an instance of the actual SQL implementation of our persistence layer, and we're injecting that into the logic layer. And then we run a test. So the tests that I've got here are going to be very similar to the kinds of unit tests that you would have written for your logic layer. I'm not doing anything fancy here. I'm just running the same kinds of tests. I am expecting certain kinds of data to be in the database. So when I get stuff back from this initial database, I'm expecting that to happen. That's OK. You may want to make test specific sets of this is what the database looks like for this test. And in that case, you wouldn't have a general before method that's putting everything back in the original state. You'd have a test specific implementation that copies a test specific script file. That will get real awkward real fast because you're going to have to keep a bunch of script files all synchronized with the same schema. Don't do that. Please don't do that. That's my advice to you. Don't do that. If you are expecting something to be in your database in a specific test, then that's part of the behavior that you're testing. Insert it and then check to see that it's there. After the test is finished, so there's a bunch of tests, we delete that file. We delete the temporary file that we made so that we're going to get back into the same original state for every single test that we're running. None of these tests depend on other tests. I can start running one test, and it doesn't matter that none of the other tests have run. Android Studio can pick these tests up in any order it wants, and it doesn't matter what the order is because they're all independent of one another. Running these integration tests is expensive. This is going to be fairly fast because it's all on my local machine. It's all on my local machine. I'm just going to be copying a file from one place to another, making changes to that one file with my relational database manager, and then deleting that one file. I'm going to do it a bunch of times. It's going to be fairly fast. So I'll run this. It was fairly fast. It took two seconds. It's not significantly longer than your unit tests. It's not significantly longer than your unit tests, but we're also doing this entirely on this local machine. When you start to do things like have a real relational database server making connections to this thing and having to reset that database, now integration testing becomes very expensive. So getting everything back into the original state, doing stuff in your logic layer and then resetting it again, that's an expensive operation. When you're doing unit testing, the goal with unit testing is that you want to be able to run it all the time. Every time you make changes, it should be super fast for me to just run the unit test. It takes a second. Integration tests, maybe not quite as frequently. Typically, what I would expect is that this is something that you'd run every once in a while, or whatever your definition of every once in a while is. I'm going to assert that it's not constantly. You wouldn't want to be running all of your unit tests and all of your integration tests. 
maybe hourly as you're doing dev work, maybe daily. Maybe this is something that you build into uh, something like your version control system to run daily tests and builds, and that's part of your um, testing suite. So that's integration testing. You can find this integration test on uh, the sample project on GitLab right now. It's already up there. I would suggest that you use something like this. Similar to you know, copying the script to the device, you are more than welcome to copy just wholesale my uh, testutils.copyDB method to your own code. That's totally fine. You can use that if you want to. We OK with this? Generally OK? OK, OK, good. Let's move on to system testing. We're still missing one layer from this whole thing. And the one layer that we're missing from this whole thing is the presentation layer. System testing now is that we're pulling together the entire system, the whole thing. We're taking our logic layer, and we're using a real implementation of a database, and we're clicking on buttons in the front end. We're clicking on buttons in the presentation layer. Testing here is simulating the interaction that a user might have with the presentation layer itself. Before you can start creating these system tests, so I showed you last class what a system test looks like in terms of code. The general flow here is that you start with creating acceptance tests instead of starting to write code for system tests. Acceptance tests are tests that are written by your users. They are usually written by your users, and they are written from the user stories that you have implemented. User stories are those things that are of the form. As a user, I need to be able to do something in this system. The goal here is that we want an actual person to be able to sit down pick up a user story and go through that user story in the app to verify that it works the way that it's supposed to work. When acceptance tests are written, they are written by your user, typically. You are your users. You will be writing them. But they are typically written by someone who is not a dev. They are written in plain English. And the goal here is that your user would be doing this by themselves. They would be running these tests, running these tests by actually just stepping through this list of instructions about how to, so to, to, to show that this thing works. Once you have these acceptance tests written, they're then translated by you into software, Espresso tests, so that they can just be done automatically. Because it would be painful to sit there and constantly click through all this stuff and make sure that it works over and over and over again. I want to build an acceptance test for this user story. So as a content creator, I need to be able to add new videos. We haven't seen Notflix in a while, but Notflix is that application that lets people watch videos from anywhere, anytime, on any device. I want to go through the process of creating this acceptance test with the goal of you creating acceptance tests for your own projects. So let's start. Here's my user story. When I write an acceptance test, I'm basically going to be writing out the steps to reproduce, except I'm not trying to reproduce bugs here. I'm trying to reproduce the behavior that's stated in the user story itself. Notflix is a system that, that I'm going to say it has user accounts. So content creators are people who have user accounts in the system. They're going to be making changes to our persistence layer. They're going to be making changes to the system. So you have to log in before you can actually do anything. So to, to, to go through the process of this user story, the very first thing that I need to do as a content creator, if I want to upload a video or to add a new video to the system, is log in. So I'm going to write this down. Log in. With a content creator account. I've got a content creator. My content creator's name is, I don't know, Jeff.
And that's the password that my content creator has. None of you know what this means, do you? <laughs> oh, you've seen the hunt. Okay, good. Thank you. At least one person gets it. Good. It's just really old. It's like before we called the memes. Before we called the memes, it was this IRC thing, chat. Somebody was like, I'm typing in my password and all I can see are asterisks. <laughs> They're just typing their password in plain text in the chat. No, all I see are asterisks. It's okay, it's okay. Uh, explain jokes are the best jokes. I'm logging in with a content creator account. I also need to state some assumptions about the state of the app before this test starts. One assumption that I have is that the user account Jeff already exists. When I'm doing this test, I don't really want to go through the process of creating an account first. I just want that account to be there so that I can test this specific user story. I'm going to assume that when I start, this user account exists. After I log in, I need to check that I'm logged in. I have to actually confirm that I have logged into the application. So I want to check that I've logged in. And the way that I'm going to check that I've logged in is by looking for an icon. So maybe there's something that changes. I've got an avatar or something or a profile picture that shows up. Or I can look for text. Something like, welcome, Jeff. So as a user, this is me like visually looking at the screen that I have after I've clicked that login button and checking to see have I actually logged in, making some kind of confirmation that I've logged in. After I've logged in, now I can start getting to the actual user story that I want to do. Yes. Why didn't we start from already being logged in? So the assumption here that I'm making is only about the data that's in the system and not the state of the system itself. So when you open your app up, the first thing that I would see for something like this is that I need to log in. There's a username and password field. I'm not able to just immediately get to the screen where I want to start. I have to go through the flow that a user is going to go through here. Yeah. So I can assume that the user account exists. There's data in my database. I can use the same ideas that I've got with the integration testing to do that. But I can't just start up a new act, a specific activity that's gone beyond like the login flow and stuff. That's a good question, though. Thank you. So I've logged in. Now I want to go to the upload page. The way that I get to the upload page is by clicking on a specific button. There's a button on my page that has like a plus icon. As a user, if I want to upload a new video, I, I know that I'm supposed to do that. So that's the next step in my acceptance test here is click that button. Then once I've clicked on that button, I should expect to see like a file dialog prompt. I should expect to see a file dialog prompt. And when I see that file dialog prompt, I can choose a video. The video that I'm going to pick here is uh,
And I only accept the highest quality. Cat fails when I'm uploading stuff to my system. I choose the video, and then after that, wait. There might be some indication to me that my system is taking the upload. The upload is happening. And if I can make that observation, I should make that observation. But I should wait. That's the next part of this thing. Once the video is successfully uploaded, I want to be able to add details about the video itself. Enter details. Here is the description of my video. And super high def. Once I've got my description about the video entered, then I can submit the video. Click the submit button. Once I have clicked the submit button, I want to verify that the upload actually happened, that the video is now in the library. So I'm going to verify that the video is uploaded. And the way that I'm going to verify that the video is uploaded but was by navigating to the video library. And once I'm at the video library, I'm going to check that the file exists. With the description that I wrote in earlier. And once I finish that, I'm going to log out. I'm going to click that log out button. Yeah, Brady. That's a, that's a good question. How detailed do they have to be? They have to be as detailed as it is necessary for someone who doesn't know anything about your system to accomplish that task. So if, if you have log out is kind of a bad example because you're going to be logging out for every test that you're doing. But for each of those individual parts, you have to describe like what you button you need to click on with like text and stuff or an ID for the specific button that you'd be clicking on. This is excruciating. I know it. This is excruciating. But we're trying to behave as a user here. So what our user would actually need to do to go through the different steps of actually accomplishing the initial user story that we had established for this application. The user story that I have here is, as a content creator, I need to be able to add a new video to this system. I have to go step by step by step by step to verify that I'm actually able to accomplish that task. The next thing that I'm going to ask you to do is uh, next week, I'm going to ask you to do this. What I'm going to ask you to do next week is uh, very first thing, I, I want you to write an acceptance test for your own user story. I'm just going to like block the Notflix thing off here. I want you to do this for your own user stories. When we do this, uh, I'm going to ask you to, uh, to help me tidy up here at the end of the class. 
I'm going to give all of these back again next week. I want to use the back of the sheet. I want to make sure that we're using the sheets fully before we check them out. But before you go, what I'm going to ask you to do is uh, please, I'm, I'm sorry for giving them all out and then not actually being able to use them, but bring back the supplies. For this sheet, if you do not want it, please put it in the recycle bin outside. This is the user errors sheet. That's it for today. I hope you all have a great weekend. Bye, everybody.